Niha Annyeong. Hello, I am the Dark Fae, and welcome back to Confessions of a First Time Dungeon Master. As always, if you missed the last session, I will put a link for it up in the corner over here, and you can go check it out, uh, catch up on what happened, then come back here and find out what happened next. So we are now on session 28, so let's begin. Okay, so starting off in session 8, so we had the weird like little cutoff from last time. Um, so it kind of started off that um, they started off heading heading back to Bulga from like the kind of cliffside funeral site um, along the way. The Earl and his wife, they kind of uh, approach and just say that they'll start kind of getting the ships ready if there's anything that they need to prepare. They have the town's kind of resources at their disposals. And so the group kind of meets up at the Great Hall to discuss a little bit. Um, there isn't a whole lot for them to prepare, minus kind of trying to get a little bit more information about where maybe some of the wrecks are and kind of trying to chart a course and stuff like that. And so um, show them that they would probably know that a good person to talk to would be the head of either the Earl or the head of the kind of sailors guild. Um, Tabled. So as they're, those two are kind of the ones in, kind of in charge of this expedition from Bulga's side. So go down to the docks where there's just a lot of activity with um, sailors and like some of the daggers going with them um, who are kind of preparing the ships and unloading any supplies needed as it is like a day journey there, potentially a day uh, of diving and treasure gathering and then a day back so they're getting ready supplies and whatever else they think they need tabled and several um several crew members are kind of pouring over a map of the open maw to kind of figure out uh to chart exactly chart a course as to where they think the wrecks are they do have like two approximate locations um one is kind of close to the kind of northern peninsula, the northern tooth of the mall, maybe a few miles out. And then another one is a little bit further out, further um, further eastward, almost to, like, almost past the point of the mall. So there are actually two ships, um, and they kind of ask for the party's input as to what they would like to do do if like both ships should go and search one wreck at a time or if they should split off perhaps and search both at the same time to kind of speed up the process uh since water breathing is like a ritual cast and like technically you could theoretically like keep casting it um to give more and more people water breathing but like even our the druid who has this spell thought that was like a little bit cheaty so she kind of actually limited herself to just the one casting so um they ended up deciding that in order to expedite things since they had promised Fernay that um they would be ready in four days so this current day then one day to sail there one day for treasure hunting one day to sail back and then that would be kind of the fourth day the day when they're sailing back um so they decide to kind of split up one ship go to the northern wreck one ship go to the wreck that's further out um and they decide to go to the closest one the closer one up further north so um basically the two ships will sail kind of side by side until reaching approximately the area where they have to, they'd have to turn north to find the wreck, and then before that, well, Harry will cast water breathing on the appropriate people. They'll dive down, um, and then they also decide to kind of prepare or reuse the net that they had prepared for the dragon eel, kind of weigh it down so that they can gather treasure there, and then just kind of use that as a means of transport without having to like multiple casts of water walking to ferry things upwards, which is smart. It's kind of all the preparation they really needed. Um, so long rest, and then the next morning they kind of um, head out. So like Earl Mangior, his wife Nyota, Terbold, 
um, they're all in several of like their guards and like fishermen, people more accustomed to the sea, sailors, are on one ship. The party, they don't want to split the party, which is good. I was a little concerned if they did because I have plans, you know, but um, they decided to go all on one ship with Kartab as their captain. Um, so anyway, they head out kind of on the sea. I didn't really know what to do like in that daytime, like one day's sailing time and I didn't want to just be like all right it's fast track so I kind of made it so that like a lot of the sailors were kind of very curious about this like magic that lets you breathe underwater and some of them might not be that convinced some are kind of skeptical so um they kind of throwing questions at Valhiri and Umrik seeing how it worked um so they kind of invited some of the sailors on to kind of do a demonstration basically where they just took one of like the barrels of drinking water and like took turns like having an a contest on how long they can hold their breath even though they can breathe um they kind of like dunk their head underwater and try it out for themselves and to which the sailors are pretty like wow this is actually really cool it really works like a little strange at first but this is this is something we could do um basil of course wants to challenge one of the sailors since he does have such high con he can hold his breath for six minutes which is a little ridiculous but, um, so he wants to, like, challenge a sailor so he doesn't take water breathing, dunks his head down. After, like, two minutes, Umaric, like, casts blindness on him. So he just kind of, uh, freaks out a little and comes up before his breath has actually run out. So he kind of loses, but there's nothing really at stake. It's just for good fun. Um, so yeah, six minutes is nuts. After that kind of a little bit of practice, a little bit of demonstration. Um, eventually, kind of night falls, and they do sail through the night to kind of reach the destination where um, they would have to like turn off. So there are like the sailors do keep watches during the night, so the players kind of go beneath deck, have a night's sleep. Um, and this is where it kind of gets interesting because um, little do they know, but this northern peninsula is the location of one of the one of the seals that has to do with Basil's ring. So during the night, a little annoying here because one of the players who is linked to the to Basil and like his backstory Avar, he wasn't here for this part. So again, I have to like I don't want to like halt the story line or stop like giving story points because he's not here, like, he's a part of it. Uh, Basil is admittedly the main focus, but, like, I would like him to be there, or both players to kind of share and be able to experience this, but it's a little hard when uh, players need to keep ducking in and out, so. But anyways, basically, they have a dream, like, a joint dream, and this time they're standing on top of a very high cliff, kind of 40, 50 feet above the water, kind of ocean spray, a waves crashing against the rocks, ocean spray in their face, um, and they begin to feel this sort of a pull from the ocean that kind of is like calling them almost um, downwards. And both of them, they kind of almost um, not in control of their body. They kind of take a step forward, take a step forward until they step off of the edge of the cliff and they fall, um, kind of splashing into the water. Um, and as kind of just before they step off, they kind of see this vision as they are kind of transported beneath the waves, like, uh, of, a, like, a cave, and then inside into, like, a cavern that is very similar imagery to a dream that they have shared before, which is of a, like, purplish orb with kind of black swirling energy around it atop of a stone pedestal inside this, like, a cavern that is dotted with these runes. And then up in the ceiling is the is a symbol of a black moon, um, which is one of the symbols of a certain goddess, which I don't know if they remember or not. Um, and then there's also like the ethereal kind of crossing of like black change, which kind of symbolize some sort of like entrapment and might pertain to Basil's sort of link or like being imprisoned by this ring, who knows? Um, but so so they see this vision and they kind of then they come back to themselves and kind of tumble over the cliff in the dream. And right as they hit the water, 
Basil, he awakes to find the to find himself kind of meeting face first into a cold, dark ocean as he tumbles overboard. So basically, this compulsion has kind of pulled him in his sleep um, onto the deck of the ship and actually overboard. So he's now like 20 feet in the water. Um, and now like there are bells ringing, people yelling, man overboard. So apparently Basil sleeps in the nude, so that's a thing. <laughs> um, and so he tries a few things. He tries like uh, to detect magic, or he tries sending, I believe, which is a little hard underwater considering he can't breathe underwater um so he tries sending a message i think to umric who gets a few garbled words in there before basil kind of starts drowning um basil also casts detect magic to kind of see if there's anything around him but it's only a 30 foot radius and this cave is deep so he doesn't sense anything um and then Eventually, the sailors kind of throw him a rope, pull him back up, and uh, the party kind of wakes up from all this commotion going on. And with uh, Ivar, kind of with t- Ivar's telepathic link, he's kind of able to surmise what happened. Um, Ivar is f- safe in his bunk, by the way. He did not have this compulsion to leap over the edge of the ship. So they all come up and then kind of start discussing. Um, so from this. Basil believes that there is some sort of like magical aura, magical effect from northward. He kind of like consults his ring a little bit and he kind of gets like a tingling in his head of a direction kind of of where to go, which is kind of a north, northeastward kind of towards the point of the northern tooth of the maw. Um, so he kind of convinces his, convinces the party to maybe go and check it out doesn't really explicitly say what it's pertaining to, just that some magical aura may be pertaining to his ring and then um, <laughs> calls in a few favors to his party members to go there. So they agree. Um, and in the morning, they kind of try to convince the Earl to let them do so. Um, Earl, A, they roll really bad persuasion. He, the Earl's not too keen on it since they don't fuck around with like ancient magical mystic shit and they're much more interested in kind of seeing what they can salvage from the wrecks because that's kind of the whole thing in like the whole point of this like in the beginning. Um, I will say I find it a little bit odd. Well, not odd, but like a little... Maybe a tiny bit hypocritical that they were like, oh, we keep our promises to like the to the Earl and to Bulga to go on this expedition, so we can't go help Fernay. But now that they're on this expedition, they're like, oh, but we're gonna go check this out real quick before we go diving into the wreck, or instead of going to go, I don't know. I guess they think they have. I guess they might have time, but I had like they'd initially thought that like they would want the whole day for treasure hunting. But anyways, um, so in the end, the Earl agrees that, like, the ship can maybe drop them off, like, at the halfway point between the Tooth of the Maw and the wreck. So I mean, it's still, like, a few miles out since the ship can't get overtly close to, like, the cliffside where the rocks are. Um, and then like, they can go there do their stuff, send a message, and then they can either um, be picked up or they can meet the rest of the sailors at the first wreck, which is maybe a few miles out. So, um, so Valhiri casts water breathing on the appropriate people, which uh, Ivar, being a warforged, does not need to eat, drink, or breathe, so he doesn't actually really need um water breathing uh but and valhiri she reasons that she's going to be in her wild shape which is true but also a bit nerve-wracking if you don't have wild shape anymore and she doesn't have water breathing suffocation drowning might come into play so but she doesn't take it so 
Only three members of the party have water breathing, Emmerich, Basil, and Tyrell, and then she casts um, water breathing four members of the ship going a little further out, and then the three members who are going to be uh, searching the wreck that's closer to them. So, um, eventually they sail their separate ways and get there. One thing I should note is I'm very bad with distances and kind of like measuring distances and the time it would take to move a certain distance, even with like all like the movement guides, like you can move this far in a day. I, it's very hard for me to estimate times, which comes into play later. But so they go a couple miles, which takes a few miles, which takes a, depending on the wind, like an hour, hour or two, drop off the party in like this rowboat. And they row another few miles, which takes a few hours, um, to as close to the, to the, I've been saying the whole time, the northern teeth of the Ma. They kind of pull up the boat on some rocks and wedge it as best they can, secure it with a rope and some pythons, pittons, pythons, pittons, um, to the rocks so it's very pretty secure. And then Fahiri transforms into octopus and they dive. So now is where it gets to the not so great part, maybe, of the of the session. So basically with water breathing, I'm kind of ruling that the water kind of replaces the water in their lungs. It kind of pushes in and out, very similar to air, and that kind of helps weigh them down along with all their armor and all of their gear. Um, so basically it takes a few minutes for them to all kind of sink to the bottom while here you can swim. Uh, since none of them have a swimming speed. Um, and it is about 500 to 600 feet, like 550 feet down to the bottom. It is a very cloudy day and there's not a whole lot of like direct sunlight coming through. Um, and down at this depth, like 600 feet, it's pretty dark. Not necessarily, it's not like maybe 100% like the real world where I think it's down to like a few thousand feet. That there's still like a zone where you can kind of see, but um, it's D and D. It's D and D. <laughs> they kind of are just following Basil's direction as to where this like mental pull is going. So he's like, he and Vahi Vahiri decide to kind of go scout ahead, and the group will kind of just walk along on the ocean floor. So now um, they do have like a continual flame torch, so they do have a light source. And so here it's like, okay, so Basil, Valhiri, they go ahead and scout. Basil, who does not have a swimming speed, is a speed of 15. Valhiri, as an octopus, is a speed of 60, but he's, she's also like pulling someone. Normally when grappling somebody, you go half speed, but like he's, not necessarily being grappled. He could also be moving on his own. So I'm kind of giving them like mid to half to full, like somewhere in the middle of that. So like 45, 40, 45, which I don't think is technically, which is generous, we'll say. So basically I, w I was saying that it's about, I feel like from where they are, maybe like a half mile to the, to the um, peninsula, estimating. And so I was saying that that maybe takes them 20, 30 minutes to get there. And then this is kind of where our druid piped up. Well, I was doing some math earlier and moving at a speed of like 45 feet. Like, I could, like, theory, like, I could get there like in a matter of like, I think she's 10 minutes or so. Like, so I was like, okay, sure. I'll say 10, 20 minutes since you are following a direction and like there are obstacles to navigate around and my not, you're not always going in like the straight shot towards the cave, but sure, I'll say 20 minutes, you can get there fine. So when they're closer to the cave, the pull gets much more intense, 60 feet from the cave because they have to see it. Um, from the cliff face, they kind of, they do see, like, a cave, a dark hole with, like, seaweed kind of waving in front of it. 
Um, and so there they decide to stop and kind of wait for the rest of the party. So the rest of the party, who is currently just like walking along the forest floor, um, the ocean floor, which is like silent, it's dark. Occasionally, like they see like little fish, maybe and other aquatic water life kind of come forward to kind of look at them curiously and then dart away. Sometimes they kind of um, see the shape of like a larger predatory shark kind of swimming by, but they don't seem to be bothered. Um, and I said it would probably take them, since they're traveling much slower, um, take them a good like 30 minutes or so to catch up. 30, yeah, 30 minutes or so, because they're, they're kind of moving at a speed and they're kind of moving at a slower speed. It's the age-old math problem of if person A is moving in a direction at, at 20 miles an hour and person B is moving at 10 miles an hour, when will they reach, you know? So, <laughs> um, so basically, I ha they, the thing is, though, it's dark. They don't have a direction they have a direction of like north northeast and so i'm like okay how are you guys trying to follow basil and valhiri and they're just like we're going and we're going forward i'm like okay um ivara was trying to say that like oh maybe with our tele telepathy like do i have a sense of direction to which no there's no sense of direction or like constantly knowing where person is you just send messages and get messages back but i was like if you want to try and go that route share it roll me survival check he rolls a 13 second half he rolls an 11 which are not very good rolls when you're in the middle at sorry not even in the middle at the bottom of the ocean walking with no like visual guide no anything of where your friends have gone so when the, the 20, 30 minutes pass where they should finally meet, I just, I say that, um, when the, I just tell them that you don't, you don't see them. You don't see your octopus and bard friend and you guys similarly don't see them, your party. So they're like, okay, well now we got to find each other. And, but then the group walking is just like, well, I guess we just keep going because they don't know whether they've figured off direction, which they have, or what? So, like, I don't know. Um, Valhiri, like, Valhiri and Basil at this time have like, started to double back and are searching for them. They roll a bad perception. They roll, like, a nine. Basil's blind. They don't see them. And at this point, it's like, somehow they don't have a way to find each other, even though, like, me as the DM, slash me as, like, a D&D &D player, I feel like there are definitely ways that things that they could try to find them, like looking for footprints on the ground or like trying to send out like, you know, like signal flares or like some sort of disturbance in the ocean to pinpoint your location. Avar was saying like, are there any distinct th um, like landmarks that I could describe as like roll a perception check? He rolls like a, like an eight. And so it was like, ugh. I'm sorry, probably not, because since you're at the bottom of the ocean, it's hard to see. Difficult to describe anything very distinct, and plus, it's not like they would have necessarily seen it before to know where to go to get to you. And, like, at this point, it was like, I don't know, I could tell that it was getting a little bit frustrating for my players. I was kind of, like, kind of not getting frustrated, but also, like, feeling bad for them because they were rolling very poorly. They had just like a series of like rolls like 13 and below that weren't helping them. So now so essentially I was thinking that they're in the situation where um, basically the group walking has kind of veered off course and they've had it east east and it's from where like the, the peninsula basically peninsula is here and then Basil Valhiri maybe here and then they've kind of wandered off over this way. Either, I don't know, from taking just like, you know, how directions can slightly drift when you're kind of trying to walk in a straight line or kind of roving around seaweed or obstacles and they just like started kind of going off in a slightly wayward direction. Um, so at this point, 
they're trying to come up with things. Um, Basil, he kind of comes up with a creative use for Dispel Magic, which, um, I guess I can put it up, Dispel Magic, and he's quite right in that it doesn't require you seeing, like, a the magical effect that you're trying to dispel. You just kind of sense it, or, like, if you know it's there. And so he's like, can I use Dispel Magic to target the continual flame that they have and try to put it out? And at this point, because I know my players are getting annoyed, I maybe should have thrown in an encounter. And I did have some Sahagan encounters, Sahagan, Sahagan, fish people encounters planned. But like, with where they are, it's not really the right location for it to happen, and it's not really where they should be for the encounter. And I didn't want to just be like, "Well, here's the encounter anyway." So it was a creative use, but I mean. Te- Technically, I was thinking that they were maybe like 250, 300 feet out. So technically, that was out of range. Um, and earlier, he had asked if he could maybe create like a light with Minor Illusion. But Minor Illusion, the cantrip, specifically says that you can't create light. Like if you create an, you can create an object, but the object does not emit light. So I was feeling kind of shitty for like shooting down all of the all of their like creative ideas even because it's not in scope so i kind of just gave it to him i said like i'll say sure like the very edge of your range you can kind of sense the continued flame and snuff it out like 120 feet in darkness with a decently bright torch light like you would probably be able to see as long as there's not like something obviously blocking you so then, like, I don't know, our druid was kind of like, oh, they were only, like, 120 feet away, to which I was like, well, no, but, I mean, if you want to keep, keep, in my head, I was like, if you want to keep trying to find them, like, sh- I could say that, no, you wasted your third level spell slot, you still have no idea where the hell the rest of your party is. So I went with the route to kind of award that creativity instead, even though it technically wouldn't have worked. Um... Maybe should have made him roll like a like an arcana or perception check or something, but um, so I went with that instead. And so this is kind of a, a not like a a dilemma that I've found myself kind of faced with is like when to reward like the creative use of things because I don't want to. I feel like a lot of what happens is like they want to do something, but it's either out of scope or like the spell doesn't work that way. Like, because it's written, rules is written, like, not because it's like, oh, yeah, maybe you could do this. And I'm just like, no, fuck that. But it's like in the spell, it says, like, it does this and they want to do something, it, you know. So I was like having a hard time trying to be able to reward them creatively. And I don't want to, like, shit on all of their ideas because that's not fun. That's not like D&D. You should be able to expand and, like, do what you want to do within reason so i don't know it was a little difficult and i think that will be something that kind of comes up in the future and i i don't know sometimes i think i get a little bit too caught up on rules but i'm also a big believer in kind of because like some abilities are like actual things that like other classes or other people like have to like level up to get or take a spell in order to do and then just kind of giving that to somebody because they're like I want to do it it seems kind of unfair so I don't I kind of try to avoid that and so that's why I'm a bit more of a stickler for rules but especially if like a spell is specifically like this spell cannot do this and they're like I want to do it but I'm like I'm sorry you can't so Uh, that's hopefully something that I can resolve a little bit better in the future. Anyways, so they eventually find each other again. Um, I was pleased that one of the, one of my players was like, I don't want to be split up again. Like that was like being alone in the empty ocean was scary. I'm like, good. That's what I was going for. So they all kind of go as a group now very slowly, 15 feet since they don't have swimming speeds and make their way following Basil's kind of pull. At which point, when they get close enough, Ivar actually also kind of senses that. 
almost like current, like pulling them forward. Um, eventually they reach the mouth of the cave and go inside, and that's where we end the session, because I'm a little bit concerned about a few things. Maybe I don't have to be that concerned, but one is that Valhiri, the druid, does not have water breathing. She should be okay if she's able to kind of wild shape again if she loses her wild shape, because I don't know if any of them are aware of what's gonna happen. Like, in-game-wise, only Basil and Avar should have an idea, um, but they all have heard like the description of the dreams before to kind of maybe get a sense of what's to come. But they seem to think that there's like some sort of a magical item or like magical thing that they're here to find. But that's not really the case. Um, and I don't know if any of them are really prepared for combat. Because that's kind of a big thing with what's about what of where they're going. I'm, I've had a lot of fun, like, prepping this. I'm calling it the Drowned Guardian. Uh, I won't put in too many spoilers, but I'm a little, maybe a little bit worried that our cleric doesn't have revivify. Maybe a little bit worried that I didn't balance this very well. But it's meant to be difficult, and it's meant to be scary. So, who knows? That will be for next time, but I'm ex Excite a little excited, a little nervous, a little, <laughs> who knows what's going to happen. Um, still working out some of the kinks and like the combat and like layer actions and um, like residual magic effects of like this orb because I want to make it a cool encounter because these like seals have been like a recurring motif and there's more than one if, if they want to try and break them all then there's going to be very got to be like variations on how of each one and they need to be unique but also somewhat similar because of like the overarching theme of like the goddess but anyways that's enough i've rambled on enough so thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed sorry i got a little bit salty but that happens with dming sometimes so um don't forget to like comment and subscribe for more videos i have kind of cut back again to doing one every other day instead of every day found I couldn't really keep it up with like work and everything else so um I love you all and I'll see you in the next one bye